a testing strategy is affected by the tools, frameworks, and techniques that you use. In this video, we'll cover topics like RoboElectric, testing form factors, Espresso device, or Grainol managed devices. So let's start with a very important type of test, screenshot testing. A screenshot test takes a screenshot of your app and compares it with a previously approved image. If they're different, you either fix a problem or approve the new image. In case you haven't watched it, this is the pyramid that we discussed in the previous video. Screenshot tests can be used in almost every category, maybe except in unit tests. You can create component screenshot tests that verify that your UI components are displayed correctly in different situations, or feature application and release candidate tests that cover bigger parts of the UI, the differences in the scope. As with any other type of test, you should try to make them as small as possible to verify the subject and the test, that is, matching the size of the test with its scope and try not to make them unnecessarily big. The problem with screenshot tests is that it's dangerously easy to create new ones. So our first recommendation is to think about limiting the number of screenshot tests as part of your testing strategy. There are multiple reasons for it. The first issue is related to how and where you store the reference images, which are normally PNG files. You can check them into your repository, but you should take into account that Git is not optimized for binary files, and it can make your repo grow in size very quickly. As alternatives, you can also use Git LFS, which means large file storage, or use some cloud-based service to store the screenshots. They all have pros and cons. Our recommendation is that you start checking the screenshots into your Git repo, and if it becomes a problem, you do something about it. Platform differences. This issue is something you can't ignore. When you take a screenshot, the screenshot tools use libraries that use other libraries and other libraries until you end up making platform calls to render things like text, shadows, etc. If we take a screenshot on an emulator and zoom in, and then we compare platforms, you'll find that Linux, Windows, and Mac all render these things differently. They have subtle differences that are going to create false negatives. You have multiple ways to overcome this. The simplest solution is to set a difference threshold. All screenshot testing tools have a way to set some tolerance when comparing images. Another option is to always take screenshots on the same platform. Given that all your tests will eventually be executed on CI, you can make your CI system generate, compare, and commit new screenshots for you. There's a lot we could say about screenshot testing. So if you want more detail, you can check out the new official documentation that we released recently. Now let's talk about RoboElectric, because it's something that you should consider for your general testing strategy if you don't use it yet. RoboElectric is an open source framework maintained by Google. It lets you run tests in a simulated Android environment inside a JVM without the overhead of an emulator or device. Many big projects use RoboElectric to increase the speed and reliability of their tests. For example, it's used extensively at Google. It's not a complete replacement for an emulator. It doesn't support all APIs and features, and it doesn't even have a screen. However, by running tests on JVM, you reduce the expenses associated with running on real devices and emulators, which can be considerable when you need to test on multiple devices. RoboElectric started as a collection of mocks called Shadows to allow developers to create unique tests. This was back when everyone put all their code in their activities. But now we have the architecture best practices, Kotlin flows, dependency injection, and it's not as necessary. But I'd like to focus on the other way to use RoboElectric, which can also reduce the size of your tests while keeping the scope. You can run Compose or Espresso tests on RoboElectric on the JVM, which makes them a lot faster and more reliable. You just have to move them to the local test source set. However, you will be limited by RoboElectric support. For example, web views are not supported. And you'll see small differences compared to emulators, similar to what we showed before if you take a screenshot using RoboElectric. But if you follow our architecture guidance, you'll be able to isolate your UI correctly from dependencies that would be problematic, like web view. If you want to read more about it, we added a brand new section to the documentation talking about RoboElectric testing strategies. Speaking of UI tests, with all the tools that we've already talked about, we have enough to start thinking about how our testing strategy verifies different screen sizes and form factors. It is 
extremely important to automate this process because app developers don't usually have a phone, a foldable, a tablet, a watch, and a Chromebook when developing features. So it's very common to implement a feature using a phone, but at the same time, break something else on a tablet. So regression testing is super important. The alternative is to put more resources on manual QA, but every form factor is going to increase costs and delay releases. So what should you test? Well, first, the obvious, the layouts. Screenshot tests are a very effective way to catch regressions. But testing all of these combinations for every screen would be costly using different devices. So in Compose, you can use a utility called Device Configuration Override. It lets you emulate different window sizes in a single device. In this example, we're rendering an expanded layout inside a portrait phone emulator. This doesn't replace release candidate tests, obviously, but it will catch most regressions. Next, if you use RoboElectric, you can set the width, height, and density of the screen using qualifiers. And that's it. You can even do it in the middle of a test. This is extremely powerful, and it keeps tests small. However, we're talking about testing layouts. If you want to verify other things, like state restoration or lifecycle calls, RoboElectric might not recreate things exactly the same way as a device would. So let's talk about state restoration, because that's something important to test, too. If you use Compose, you can use State Restoration Tester. It's very easy to use, but it only verifies Compose state. To test lifecycle changes in bigger tests when using emulators, you have Espresso Device. It lets you send commands to the emulators to rotate, unfold, etc. That way, you can test that the screen state and navigation state are restored correctly in different layouts, for example. For more information, details, and code examples, check out the Test Different Screen and Window Sizes page. Big tests can catch a lot of different issues, but they are more prone to occasional failures, especially if they run on emulators or devices. Emulators and on-device tests have come a long way, but they're never going to be as reliable as JVM tests or RoboElectric. Even if a test fails once every 1,000 executions, nowadays tests are run many times per day. So a flaky test will find its way to ruin your productivity. So there are three things you can do to prevent flakiness. Prevent synchronization issues yourself, configure devices and emulators correctly, or implement retries. Let's start with the first one. Sometimes the flakiness is your fault. Your app does things in the background that your tests don't know about. There are two strategies to fix those. Idly in resources, let your app communicate to the test when it's busy. It's like adding instrumentation points. By the way, they're called Espresso idly in resources, but they can be used in Compose, UI Automator, et cetera. Some big projects are very successful with idly in resources, but it takes a while to get them to work, in my experience. The new approach that we recommend is waiting for things to happen instead. Let's see how you can do that with the different frameworks. In Compose, we have these functions that you can access from Compose test rule to wait for things. Wait until at least one exists, does not exist, exactly one, and node count. Espresso doesn't have this functionality baked in, but you can find a lot of snippets, actions, and even wrappers over Espresso that do this. If you use UI Automator or any other frameworks that use it, you can wait for things with a snippet similar to this, calling device.wait with an until object. If that's not enough to fix flaky tests, you can always try retrying, since it's almost impossible to have a fully reliable test suite. You might need to use retries in multiple situations to prevent issues, such as when the connection to the device is lost or a test failure occurs. How you implement retries depends on the testing frameworks and infrastructure you're using, but typical mechanisms include a JUnit rule that retries any test a number of times, a retry step in your CI workflow, or a system to restart an emulator when it's unresponsive, which can be handled automatically with a solution called Gradle Manage Devices. So let's see how GMD works. Gradle Manage Devices is an Android Gradle plugin feature that lets you define which emulators to use directly in your Gradle build files. Just describe the devices you want in the build script, and the Android Gradle plugin creates them, runs your tests on them, and shuts them down for you. And GMD is designed for scale. Some of its features include using snapshots to boot quickly, running tests in parallel, retrying as needed, sharding across multiple devices, and using stripped down versions of the system images, called automated test devices, or ATD, to run headless with much fewer resources. 
Finally, let's talk about AI and testing. I'm very excited about what the future holds because testing is sometimes tedious and repetitive. But with tools like Gemini for Android Studio, now creating unit tests is a lot easier. You can use them to figure out not only what to test, but how to implement those tests. And at the top of the pyramid, we have upcoming tools like Journeys with Gemini that uses natural language to describe user journeys and can even analyze screens to make assertions that would be extremely hard to verify with other techniques. If you want to learn more about testing strategies and tools, you can visit the testing guide. You'll find links to all the resources we talked about in the video description. Thank you for watching and happy testing.